Chapter 12 The next morning, when I came down to breakfast, I found everybody, even the children, looking grave. It seemed that by some mysterious local tom-tom, Aunt Sadie had learned that Lady Patricia Dugdale had died in the night. She had suddenly collapsed. Lord Mondor was sent for, but by the time he could arrive she'd become unconscious, and an hour later was dead. Oh, poor Patricia, Aunt Sadie kept saying, very much upset, while Uncle Matthew, who cried easily, was mopping his eyes as he bent over the hot plate, taking a sausage, or in his parlance a banger, with less than his usual enthusiasm. I saw her only last week, he said, at the Clarendon Yard. Yes, said Aunt Sadie, I remember you told me. Poor Patricia, I always liked her so much, though, of course, all that about being delicate was tiresome. Well, now you can see for yourself that she was delicate, said Davy triumphantly. She's dead. It killed her. Doesn't that show you? I do wish I could make you radlets understand that there is no such thing as imaginary illness. Nobody who is quite well could possibly be bothered to do all the things that I, for instance, am obliged to in order to keep my wretched frame on its feet. The children began to giggle at this, and even Aunt Sadie smiled because they all knew that so far from it being a bother to Davy, it was his all-absorbing occupation, and one which he enjoyed beyond words. Oh, of course, I know you all think it's a great, great joke, and no doubt Jassy and Victoria will scream with laughter when I finally do conk out, but it's not a joke to me, let me tell you, and a liver in that state can't have been much of a joke to poor Patricia, what's more. Poor Patricia, and I fear she had a sad life with that boring old lecturer. This was so like Aunt Sadie. Having protested for years against the name lecturer for boy Dugdale, she was now using it herself. It always happened. Very soon, no doubt, we should hear her chanting, Man's long agony. For some reason that I could never understand, she really loved him. Until lately, said Davy, I think that for the past year or two it has been the other way round, and he had begun to depend on her, and then it was too late. She'd stopped bothering about him. Possibly. Anyway, there it is. All very sad. We must send a wreath, darling, at once. What a time of year. It will have to come from Oxford, I suppose. Oh, the waste of money. Send a wreath of frog spawn, frog spawn, frog spawn. Lovely, lovely frog spawn. It is my favourite thing, sang Jassie. If you go on being so silly, children, said Aunt Sadie, who had caught a look of great disapproval on Alfred's face, I shall be obliged to send you to school, you know. "'But can you afford to?' said Victoria. "'You'd have to buy us plimsolls and gym tunics, "'underclothes in a decent state, and some good strong luggage. "'I've seen girls going off to school. "'They're covered with expensive things. "'Of course, we long for it. "'Pashes for the prefects and rags in the dorm. "'School has very sexy side, you know, Sadie. "'Why, the very word mistress, Sadie. "'You know...' "'But Aunt Sadie was not really listening. "'She was away in her cloud and merely said... Mm, very naughty and silly, and don't call me Sadie. Aunt Sadie and Davy went off to the funeral together. Uncle Matthew had his bench that day, and particularly wanted to attend in order to make quite sure that a certain ruffian who was to come up before it should be committed to the assizes, where, it was very much to be hoped, he would get several years and the cat. One or two of Uncle Matthew's fellow beaks had curious modern ideas about justice, and he was obliged to carry on a strenuous war against them, in which he was greatly assisted by a retired admiral of the neighbourhood. So they had to go to the funeral without him, and came back in low spirits. "'It's the dropping off the perches,' said Aunt Sadie. "'I've always dreaded when that begins. Soon we shall all have gone. Oh, well, never mind.' "'Nonsense,' said Davy briskly. Modern science will keep us alive and young, too, for many a long day yet. Patricia's insides were a terrible mess. I had a word with Dr. Simpson while you were with Sonia, and it's quite obviously a miracle she didn't die years ago. When the children have gone to bed, I'll tell you. No, thank you, said Aunt Sadie, while the children implored her to go then and there with them to the Hons' cupboard and tell. 
It is unfair. Sadie doesn't want to hear the least bit, and we die to. How old was Patricia? said Aunt Sadie. Older than we are, said Davy. I remember when they married, and she was supposed to be quite a bit older than boy. And he was looking a hundred in that bitter wind. I thought he seemed awfully cut up, poor boy. Aunt Sadie, during a little graveside chat with Lady Mondor, had gathered that the death had come as a shock and surprise to all of them, that although they had known Lady Patricia to be far from well, they had no idea that she was in immediate danger. In fact, she had been greatly looking forward to her trip abroad the following week. Lady Mondor, who resented death, clearly thought it most inconsiderate of her sister in law to break up their little circle so suddenly, and Lord Mondor, devoted to his sister, was dreadfully shaken by the midnight drive with a deathbed at the end of it. But surprisingly enough, the one who had taken it hardest was Polly. It seemed that she had been violently sick on hearing the news, completely prostrated for two days, and was still looking so unwell that her mother had refused to take her to the funeral. It seems rather funny, said Aunt Sadie, in a way. I'd no idea she was so particularly devoted to Patricia, had you, Fanny? Nervous shock, said Davy. I don't suppose she's ever had a death so near to her before. Oh, yes, she has, said Jassy. Ranger. Dogs aren't exactly the same as human beings, my dear Jessie. But to the Radlets, they were exactly the same, except that to them, dogs on the whole had more reality than people. Do tell about the grave, said Victoria. Not very much to tell, really, said Aunt Sadie. Just a grave, you know, lots of flowers and mud. They'd lined it with heather, said Davy, from Craigside. Poor Patricia, she did love Scotland. And where was it? In the graveyard, of course, at Silkin, between the Wellingtonia and the Blood Arms, if you see where I mean. In full view of boy's bedroom window, incidentally. Jassy began to talk fast and earnestly. You will promise to bury me here, whatever happens, won't you? Won't you? There's one exact place I want. I note it every time I go to church. It's next door to that old lady who was nearly a hundred. That's not our part of the churchyard, miles away from Grandfather. No, but it's the bit I want. I once saw a dear little dead baby vole there. Please, please, please don't forget. You'll have married some sewer and gone off to live in the Antipodes, said Uncle Matthew, who'd just come in. They let that young hog off, said there was no evidence. Evidence be damned. You'd only got to look at his face to see who did it. Afternoon completely wasted. The Admiral and I are going to resign. Then bring me back, said Jassy, pickled. I'll pay, I swear I will. Please, far you must. Write it down, said Uncle Matthew, producing a piece of paper and a fountain pen. If these things don't get written down, they are forgotten. And I'd like a deposit of ten bob, please. You can take it out of my birthday present, said Jassy, who was scribbling away with great concentration. I've made a map like in Treasure Island, she said. See? Yes, thank you, that's quite clear, said Uncle Matthew. He went to the wall, took his master key from his pocket, opened a safe and put in the piece of paper. Every room at Alkenley had one of these wall safes, whose contents would have amazed and discomfited the burglar who managed to open them. Aunt Sadie's jewels, which had some very good stones, were never kept in them, but lay glittering about all over the house and garden, in any place where she might have taken them off and forgotten to put them on again, on the downstairs wash basin, by the flower bed she'd been weeding, sent to the laundry, pinning up a suspender. Her big party pieces were kept in the bank. Uncle Matthew himself possessed no jewels and despised all men who did. Boy's signet ring and platinum and pearl evening watch chain were great causes for tooth grinding. His own watch was a large, loudly ticking object in gun metal, tested twice a day by Greenwich Mean Time on a chronometer in the business room, and said to gain three seconds a week. This was attached to his key ring across his moleskin waistcoat by an ordinary leather boot lace in which Aunt Sadie often tried to tie knots to remind herself of things. The safes, nevertheless, were full of treasures, if not of valuables, for Uncle Matthew's treasures were objects of esoteric worth, such as a stone quarried on the estate and said to have imprisoned for two thousand years a living toad, Linda's first shoe, the skeleton of a mouse regurgitated by an owl, 
a tiny gun for shooting blue bottles, the hair of all his children made into a bracelet, a silhouette of Aunt Sadie down at a fair, a carved nut, a ship in a bottle, altogether a strange mixture of sentiment, natural history, and little objects which from time to time had taken his fancy. Come on, do let's see, said Jessie and Victoria, making a dash at the door in the wall. There was always great excitement when the safes were opened, as they hardly ever were, and seeing inside was considered a treat. Oh, that dear little bit of shrapnel, may I have it? No, you may not. It was once in my groin for a whole week. Talk about death, said Davy. The greatest medical mystery of our times must be the fact that dear Matthew is still with us. It only shows, said Aunt Sadie, that nothing really matters the least bit, so why make these fearful efforts to keep alive? Oh, but it's the efforts that one enjoys so much, said Davy, and this time he was speaking the truth.